Westfield Memorial Hospital provides high-quality health care to residents of Western New York, offering patients the most sophisticated medical advancements while keeping the ease and familiarity of a community hospital. Support for Chautauqua Sunrise has been provided by WRFA 107.9 FM, Jamestown's public radio station, streaming online 24-7 at WRFALP.com. Low power to the people. Chautauqua Sunrise is made possible by a grant from Fredonia Place, a continuing care retirement community providing dignity in a modern luxury environment. Peter's Restaurant, a family tradition for over 50 years in downtown Ripley, is a proud supporter of Chautauqua Sunrise. Peter's provides all-day dining, banquet services, and custom catering, specializing in pie. Funding for Chautauqua Sunrise is provided in part by the Chautauqua County Industrial Development Agency, with offices in Jamestown and Dunkirk, helping businesses to prosper throughout Chautauqua County. From supporting people with disabilities to enjoy great lives to providing health care services that are available to anyone, the Resource Center has been improving our county for more than 60 years. Learn more about how the Resource Center makes a positive difference in people's lives. From the Access Chautauqua Studios in Mayville, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Chautauqua Sunrise is hosted by Doc Hamels and supported by the award-winning volunteers at Access Chautauqua. We are here to share local news, colorful interviews, and events of interest to everyone. Chautauqua Sunrise is broadcast live Saturday mornings each week from 9 to 10 a.m. Send events via email or call us live. Check us out on YouTube and Facebook. And now, from the Access Chautauqua Studios, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Chautauqua Sunrise. It's been a while since uh, I was here, and uh, we, uh, we pre-taped last week, and that was... Uh, a particularly good reason I uh, was able to accompany my cousin from the Netherlands, Cor Hamels, as he ran the uh, uh, Amish Marathon in Randolph, New York. The Amish didn't run it, but he w that was the the title of it, and uh, he did quite well. He, he took third place, and uh, then we throughout the the week we got to visit with them. Uh, he and his wife Krista, and uh, got to see some of the sights of Western New York, and got over to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. That was a lot of fun. So uh, I know they're still uh, traveling throughout the Eastern Seaboard and uh, safe travels to you folks. And um, you know, it's always interesting to spend time with um, family, friends, just new acquaintances from another country and just sit around and talk and you just find, gosh, there's so much in common that we have uh, whether it's we're talking about schools, taxes, health care, whatever, uh, our children, how we raise them and things like that. So uh, had a great time visiting with them. This is our third time we've, we, we've uh, been with them, and so that was, it was nice. But first time here in the United States. Okay, so good afternoon to everyone that's watching this throughout the, the, the world. Uh, we're not streaming today because we've had some technical difficulties. So uh, maybe it'll happen. I don't know. You never know. Uh, live TV is always interesting. So sometimes uh, the equipment doesn't do what we want it to do. But anyways, good afternoon for those who are watching, watching this later in, in the week. We uh, brought rebroadcast throughout the week on Spectrum 1301, uh, 2 and 8 every day of the week in between shows. So you can watch this show some more. And just to give you a preview, I have... I call him a good friend. We have become good friends. Uh, Jim McQuiston will be here, and he is, uh, I consider, the premier. My my opinion, uh, he might feel the same way, Oak Island theorist and researcher and author, and we're going to be discussing his ninth, and he tells me, final book on the matter. Um, it's going to be pretty interesting. So those of you that are interested in Oak Island, and you've seen Jim on, on international TV or on, I guess it's the History Channel, 
um, you can uh, tune in. He'll be here shortly, and we'll have a nice chat. Um, let's see. We give a shout out to all our dear friends and relatives down in Florida. We hope you're safe. We hope that your uh, power is on again and that uh, uh, you have weathered the storm, as they say. Uh, I know that, geez, it's just some horrible devastation down here on the West Coast, around the Tampa, Sanibel Island, and so forth. So um, our thoughts and prayers go out to all of you that are out there that can watch this. And, of course, uh, if there's a, a need for assistance, I know that as fellow Americans, we always rise to the occasion. So we'll see what the Red Cross or other agencies uh, ask of us. I know we've donated before to other causes, so uh, we'll stay tuned on that. I, I don't have any information, though. I'll still take a couple months of snow. Over oh, you'll take snow. Day. Okay, all right. Well, yeah. Okay, uh, I hope you enjoyed last week's show. We pre-taped. Uh, as I said, and it was our, my pals from the Midnight Crawlers, uh, we uh, had a good time. I, I know we talked about it afterwards, and they enjoyed uh, playing for you, and I hope you enjoyed the music, and it was a really fun experience for everybody. Uh, and with that being said, today at noon, so this is October 1st, by the way, and uh, we'll be up at Point Gratiot uh, Park, and we're going to be playing for the... Uh, it's called, let me get the exact title here, Walk to End Alzheimer's. And that's going to be in the p big pavilion in, in uh, Point Crashit. And uh, we're happy to, to spend our time with folks that are walking that day, today. And um, it, the walk starts at 11.15, I believe. And so uh, there's activities and there's going to be food and, uh, of course, us providing music for two hours and exhibits and all kinds of stuff. So uh, you're watching right now. you got plenty of time to watch the show. And, Head on up to uh, Dunkirk and join in, or you can leave now and watch the show later, whichever you, you like. Okay, October 1, how did that happen? It's uh, pretty hard to believe that uh, uh, we were, well, last time I talked to everybody here at the show, we were still in summer, and then it was like a big switch, wasn't it? It was like flip, and it got cold and rainy and dropped something like 30 degrees overnight. Wow. You know, they, whoever decided when fall and summer and all the other uh, the other two uh, seasons take place, they pretty much got this figured out. So strange. Okay, October one also triggers. Let's see, I gotta get the, my correct hand. Here we go, up this way. It's on my left side. In the, in the camera monitor, everything looks backwards to me. But uh, we put out our our pink uh, ribbon here as a reminder to me and for all of you that this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we've done this now for nine years in a row and we will keep doing it forever, as long as we can, to remind you that, um, ladies, please do yourself and all of us a favor, get your mammograms. Uh, you know, we often don't want to go to the doctor because we don't want to hear bad news. Well, I think a little bad news is better than a lot of horrific bad news. So get over there, get your mammograms. All your hospitals locally offer them. Uh, one of my underwriters, uh, Westfield Memorial Hospital, I know has a great uh, mammogram set up there. And uh, I, I would hope that uh, you would also keep in mind that uh, men uh, can get breast cancer as well. And uh, if you have any concerns, if you feel a lump or something along these lines in your uh, breast area, please check it out. Uh, also, check it out with your doctor, that is. Also, uh, for your information, and, and this could be at other hospitals as well, I don't know, but my Rotary Club a few years ago, when I happened to be president at the time, I'm real proud of this, um, we donated money to buy models of the human breast that have simulated uh, tumors in these uh, models of the breast in its latex material. So it feels very, very close to the, uh, the real thing. And you can go there when you're having your examination and they'll help you feel in this model to see what it would feel like if you happen to have a lump and sometimes it's not cancer, sometimes it's just fatty tissue and so on. But get it checked out. Uh, I had a, a member of my family had a, uh, a breast removed due to cancer. I had another member of my, of my family that had a suspicious spot 
in their breast and now it's been marked and they track it. So I, sometimes it's, it's, it's radical, sometimes it's, it's nothing. But uh, have a, give yourself a sense of ease and, and, and uh, well-being and, and know what the situation is and, and if it needs something, if something needs to be done, get it done, don't let it go, okay? October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Shout out to all our friends in Ukraine as always. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is over there. I guess it's, I guess we decided it's afternoon by now. <clears throat> so uh, again, our thoughts are with you. And uh, I see that uh, Ukraine is applied for status with the uh, to NATO. And boy, something's got to be done over there. But uh, hang in there. Well, I do a shout out to uh, Mark and Tanya Wilson. Uh, they've been guests on my show here in the past, and I mentioned that my cousin ran in a, the marathon over there in Randolph. Good to see Mark and Tanya. Uh, they just, I don't know, they have an eternal smile on their face or what, but always smiling. Uh, they are so interested in everybody's well-being and health and exercise, and uh, they promote just good, healthy living, and it was just great to see them, so shout out to them. Okay, uh, oh! Justin, I got you have something I don't have, and I have something you don't have. Okay, Justin is a is a Harry Potter guy like me, and he just it was uh, uh, displaying it and uh, walking around here with his new uh, found uh, what would we call that sweater? Sweater and robes. Sweater and robes. So he's ready to go to Harry Potter world and hang out in Disney World. Like I told you, when I was down there, everybody was walking around in robes and things like that. But I want to do a shout out to my good friends. Over at WRFA, I have my own T-shirt, and as, there it is. And then on the back, it says uh, "Low Power to the People." Right on, okay. And uh, so, good afternoon to all my friends at WRFA, uh, one hundred seven point nine, Low Power to the People. I have my mug, and, I, and we are on your radio show every Tuesday at one o'clock. So I have uh, my cool mug and my t-shirt and for those of you that supported them thank you because by supporting them you're supporting us here uh chautauqua sunrise okay uh, let's see i think i got all my notes caught up so let's go to some announcements and i know my my guest is is in route and uh, we'll see what uh, happens here in a minute so this is from the ripley library to all those back at my hometown and I said to them, you know, if you got things coming up, you should send me this stuff so I can announce it. So here we go. Tomorrow, there's a book club th that meets at Noble Winery uh, from at 1 o'clock uh, tomorrow, uh, Sunday, October 2nd. I get together, discuss a book, sip a little wine, and make a nice e afternoon of it. Then, Nutrition with Molly. Uh, let's see here. I hope I got this right. I'm reading it the best I can. October 4th at 6 p.m. at the library. Nutrition with Molly. That's all I know. Then, Burnt Sage. October 6th from 4 to 7 p.m. is a program at the library. Autumn Rag Wreath Workshop. October 8th at 10 a.m. Okay. Local author, October 18th at 6 p.m. Elaine Brodigan. Then, Nutrition with Molly again, uh, October 20th at 11 a.m. And then, Justin, you get into this, Jigsaw Puzzle Challenge, October 22nd at 9.30. Now, how cool is this? This is an opportunity to uh, go to your local library, to uh, uh, meet with new folks, to do some activities maybe you've never done before, uh, learn how to make a rug, uh, Challenge yourself with a jigsaw. I, I suppose you all get puzzles and race that go, and whoever gets done first uh, wins something. I don't know, but it sounds like a lot of fun. But where I'm going with this is, uh, I've I've had various people here from various libraries, and your local library is really almost a community center these days of really fun activities for all ages. So uh, please, uh, if you got a rainy day and you're sitting around saying, ah, I've seen all these movies and uh, I got nothing to do. Check out your local library. Could be something for you. Okay, let's see what we got here. So coming up, I got some things here. Uh, events uh, for the weekend. This weekend right now, 
in Forestville. They have their fall festival, and it's held at Forestville Central High School at 4 Academy Street. This festival will feature a craft show, food vendors, and chili cook-off. On Sunday, there will also be chicken barbecue from noon until sold out at the Forestville Fire Hall and a parade at 1 p.m. with a lineup starting at the American Legion. For more information today and tomorrow, uh, 965-2675. This next one's kind of interesting. It's today and tomorrow, Jurassic Wonders Dinosaur drive through from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., both days at the Chautauqua County Fairgrounds over in Dunkirk. I didn't hear about this. Did you? This, no. This. Uh, see if I can say this correctly. Animatronic dinosaur show features life-size dinosaurs that visitors can see and hear from the safety of their own cars. Mission is thirteen dollars per car, so squeeze all your friends in there. For tickets or for more information, give them a call at two two six eight four seven seven. I gotta tell my grandson about this. October one and eighth. Saints and Sinners Cemetery walking tours and carriage tours at Lakeview Cemetery over in Jamestown on Lakeview Avenue. Saints and Sinners. Hmm. Walking tours will take place on October 1. That's today from 6 to 9 p.m. Just when dusk is setting in. And October 8th from 3 to 5.15 p.m. With tours departing every 45 minutes. Minutes. Carriage tours will take place October 1 at 3, 4, and 5 p.m. and October 8th at 6, 7, and 8. Take a walk or ride through the cemetery and hear the tales of some of Jamestown uh, early inhabitants. Pre-sale tickets for these uh, walking tours are $15 for non-members, $10 for Fenton History Center members, and $2 for youth. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, tickets for the carriage tour are $25 per person and must be prepaid. Tickets often sell quickly uh, for these events, so please uh, reserve your tickets. For more information, give them a call at the Fenton Center, 664-6256. I know I've, I've been considering uh, the possibility of doing some uh, cemetery walks in Ripley. I'm just not quite there yet. That would be fun. Okay. Uh, our friends at WRFA, they have a new radio program. A new locally produced radio program and podcast, there they are, ooh, uh, focusing on various social and women's issues affecting the community is making its debut this fall in Jamestown. Lovely ladies there. Why WCA Jamestown is collaborating with WRFA 107.9 to present the YWCA Jamestown broadcast radio show. The program will be a broad, will broadcast twice each week on 107.9 in Jamestown, and all episodes will also be available on demand online. The YWCA Jamestown broadcast will feature members of the local YWCA Jamestown team, Hilary Bellin, Indo Kionis, Elise Scott, and Sienna Simon. I apologize if I mispronounced anyone's name. Discussing a variety of issues and topics with various guests from the Jamestown and Chautauqua region. The program will cover a wide range of topics including diversity, equity, inclusion, issues, racial justice, and civil rights, empowerment and economic advancement of women and girls, and health and safety of women and girls. Uh, the first season of the broadcast programs runs for 30 episodes and is scheduled to start, uh, well, actually yesterday. So you're going to be able to hear these throughout the, the months to come. Uh, the YWCA Jamestown has been at the forefront of addressing several important issues facing Jamestown and Chautauqua County. They've wanted to educate their listeners about these issues, but due to limited staffing at the radio station, they've been unable to give them the focus and attention they deserve, explained Jason Sample, the WRFA station manager. That's why we reached out, or they reached out to YWCA Jamestown to see if they could assist uh, them in the effort, and they are grateful that uh, they're willing to work with the station on this exciting new project. 
This partnership provides the YWCA Jamestown with an additional opportunity to meet their mission of eliminating racism and empowering women. Each week, uh, they will work to bring subjects and topics that address racial and gender inequality and highlight issues that women in our community care about, said Amanda Giesing, YWCA uh, Jamestown Executive Director, adding, we are, they are, or we are, are looking forward to, to hearing more about the passion of our mission and concern for community issues that the YWCA broadcast team will bring to the local airways. So I encourage you that are listening to uh, WRFA locally to have a listen. Also, on my phone, I have the WRFA app, so I can listen to them anywhere I go in the world. And I am so pleased to hear that they're doing some shows on women's rights and, and so forth, especially with the, the outcry about the uh, Roe versus Wade, uh, the, uh, the overturning of the uh, abortion uh, law and so forth. This has become quite a issue as far as women's safety and health. So I'm, I'm real pleased that you were able to, uh, they're able to do that. And we've covered some of those issues here as well. Okay, just to wrap things up real quick, uh, I, got, I told you about today's walk. Uh, they are asking people to wear various colors for the Alzheimer's walk. Blue represents someone with Alzheimer's or another dementia. Purple is for those who have lost someone to the disease. Ye wear yellow for those currently supporting, caring for a person. Orange is for those who support the cause and the association's vision. So again, 10 o'clock today, things start, and then the walk itself, I believe, is 11.15. And then finally, this is Windows Mark Your Calendars, Black Violin, Give Thanks, Saturday, November 12th. Why am I telling you about this? Because this is one of those that's going to fill up fast and the tickets are going to go quick. Black Violin is comprised, composed of classically trained violinists and violist, oh, Will Baptiste and Kev Marcus, <coughs> excuse me, who combine their classical training in hip hop influences to create a distinctive multi-genre sound that is often described as classical boom. The band released their major debut about stereotypes featuring Black Thought of the Roots and MC Faro Bunch uh, on Universal Music, which debuted at number one on the Billboard Classical Crossover chart and number four on the Billboard R&B chart. So, Premium seats in Loge are $52. Orchestra seats are $42. Adults, $22. Children, 12 and under. Uh, wait a minute, hold on. Orchestra, for, uh, all right, let me start again. Premium in Loge is $52. Orchestra is $42. Adults is $22. And then, uh, I'm not quite sure exactly how this works, because they got children in under $22. So I guess you'll have to just check. But anyways, get your tickets early because they're going to fill up fast. So that's going to be again November 12th from 7 p.m. Oh, two shows, and then 9 p.m. Okay, so that's all I have for now. We're going to take a little station break, and we'll be right back. This is for you. Oh, look, a redhead. <gasps> Staring contest. <laughs> Still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. The dad was cute. You were looking right at us. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Back in the, I don't know how you all are doing with this weather change. I got the sniffles. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so my guest is here, and uh, I want to welcome back to the show Jim McQuiston. Uh, you've been here, that's like your fourth time here now. Yeah, I think so. You keep writing books, I keep bringing you back. Yeah. So, Jim, this is a, a heady subject. I mean, this is this has gotten so big. I mean, you and I have talked about this quite at quite a bit of, uh, of the time, as far as the original idea and, and where it ended up. So let's let's see if we can't just have a starting point. There was a show that started ten years ago called The Curse of Oak Island. Uh, the premise was that somebody left somebody down in a pit, uh, like. 
I don't know, 300 years ago. They don't know who did it. They don't know if there's treasure down there, but there's been a story about this for years and years and years, and the Lagina brothers and some other folks decided they were going to take over the project. How's that for quick? That's it. And somehow you got involved, and then you wrote nine books. <laughs> You told me five books ago that it was the last one or something like that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the, uh, I was first uh, enthralled with the show just because of the big equipment. Yep. You know, the guys, big, guys with their big expensive toys. But I found this little piece of information. I sent it to them. They got excited about it. I started sending them a lot of emails. Uh, eventually they asked me to come up they said you need to write a book because all this is going to get lost so my first three books were establishing who would have been there basically in general who would have been there at a time that fit a lot of the carbon dating things like that all right and so uh, you didn't know the Guinness before this no you no. just said a cold hey I got this information what do you think and, and that's how it all started and I think at the time they were still trying to collect uh, data, uh, like you know, getting working with uh, Dan Blankenship and his all his massive records, and they were trying to make amends with Fred Nolan so that they could get his papers. And they were there was just so much information that was scattered, and I think they were on an information hunt to find a place to actually start, you know, and uh, because there were different legends about Captain. Hooks, I guess, or Captain Kidd, yeah, Captain Kidd, or the Vikings, or whatever, you know, it's just a lot of random items out there. So mine, my idea, uh, got made it a little more specific to uh, an early group of Scots that settled over there from, essentially from 1623 to 1632. And so my first three books were building up to that, and I actually found a treasure that a Scottish treasure that was stolen that's never been recovered and it was worth probably a billion dollars today. So then uh, they had me up a few times and I was on the show. Now, you're, uh, even on international TV, I mean, people around the world yeah, have seen you. Yeah. But no, really, I mean, that's, yeah. that's quite a thing. So this, this whole Oak Island mystery thing, it's been going on since what 1750 uh, or something. 95. Yeah. Uh, although I I think it, they were looking for it before that. But but was, I mean, is that's the first documentation, yeah. the papers where yeah. these guys found something all pit, and and then there's been different groups of people that have been just destroying the island and digging here and digging there, yeah. and, and we've all been watching it on TV. So that you now have been part of the the process as far as who's who was there, what happened, and so forth. But there's other people that say different things. So, right. so who's Jim McQuiston to say this is even true? I mean, which, what, <laughs> so you know, who are you? Well, uh, I've been studying Scottish history for a long time, and my distant cousin, who is uh, his name is Sir Ian Macdonald, but his Gaelic patronymic they call it is McQuiston, Sir Ian Macdonald McQuiston. He is the the premier knight baronet of Nova Scotia. And that's how Nova Scotia got its name, and that's how it got settled, was through these knights baronet. Now, the family was in the second position up until 1908, and then that line died out. It was the Gordon line. Okay, so let, the, let's hold on a second. So let's roll the tape back for people that are watching or aren't familiar with all it. So this guy named William Alexander, he wants to start, what, a new world, right? Yes, yeah, because that, that was the background of this whole time, and this fits uh, the, the, the Pilgrims, uh, the Virginia group that was doing the colonies down in there, and others, uh, Roanoke Island group, perhaps the same group. Yeah, basically England was falling apart. All of the old world, you know, they, their lumber had been quite used up, their resources, um, and so. Th the the king of France and the queen uh, originally of England, Queen Elizabeth I, they were trying to send people to find new worlds where they could, you know, reap the the minerals and forests right. or whatever, and uh, and hopefully silver and gold that was <laughs> on their mind too, and so uh, different groups were sent out as early as 1602, the first group that's, that founded 
Cape Cod and Martha's mm -hmm. Vineyard and all that. That was 1602. But it, in uh, 1620, they sent the, uh, the, the Mayflower and the Pilgrims over. People think it was just some people that bought a boat and jumped on the <laughs> boat and went, but it wasn't. There was Sir Francis Bacon was behind it. There was a big movement. Uh, right? William Alexander was behind yeah. it, and this guy named Thomas Howard was behind it. Well, in my next to the last book, I decoded the, uh, there's a stone found in the bottom of the money pit. And using a uh, historic code, a well-known historic code, I found Thomas Howard's name on the stone twice. This is the 90-foot stone that they yes, were talking about? Yes, And he was also on William Alexander's map of uh, Nova Scotia from 1624, and Francis Bacon died at his house, and William Alexander, Bacon, and Howard all lived in the same neighborhood. Opels. So, you know, there, the, there's too much of that type of, of information for this to just be a whim. This isn't just, oh, maybe the Vikings went, mm -hmm. or I bet it was the Knights Templar. This is an absolute so, of people who had an interest in that area in the early 1600s and went there. So you connected dots, you, you have painted the background of the times rather than like you say, just a bunch of people got in a boat and went over. So if I remember right, so William Alexander is one of these guys that says we need, we need a new world order. We need to, where it's clean air and, and, and people can practice their own religions that we hear about with even the pilgrims right. and that, religious freedoms and things. And then he comes up with an idea that he talks to one of the kings King gives him permission to create Nova Scotia. New, New, New Scotland, right? New Scotland, yes. And then you mentioned the Knights Baronet. Who were they? Well, he was given Nova Scotia in 1621, actually as a buffer to protect Plymouth uh -huh. from the French that were in Canada. And um, he called it New Scotland because it was going to be populated particularly by uh, Scotsman under certain chieftains who would become a knight baronet. But when he, after he got the land, the land's about two thirds the size of, of uh, Scotland, but he only had so much money and mm -hmm. it was a big vast land, he needed people. So he got this idea with King James to create a new knighthood. And where most knighthoods you would get them uh, by serving the king, going out to battle, right. something like that. Kind of giving you a thank this you. One, you just got your wallet out. Oh, so it's one and, of those by by a title. Yes, and, so like on TV, you get your diploma. But <laughs> right, <laughs> and it really upset the rest of the of the knights, uh, different orders of knighthood, and and they protested, and he had to agree to never create anything like this again. But uh, so uh, predominantly Highland chiefs, uh, well, even Lowland. Mm -hmm. But uh, like the McDonald's and the Campbells, uh, the Innesses or McInneses, mm -hmm. uh, people like that signed up, and they had to pay quite a bit of money. Uh, I've seen one uh, translation of the fee they paid that came out to five hundred thousand dollars in today's money. Mm -hmm. So this, they were heavily invested. In so this. what did they get for their money? They got sixteen thousand acres of their property and fourteen thousand acres for them to create a town. Mm -hmm. Because what his idea was is if he could get enough people to try to start creating a town all the way around Nova Scotia, he'd have a defense against the French, basically, who were, they were always at war with. Uh, Nova Scotia isn't an island, but it almost is. It, it's, it's like a, pen, a peninsula, like the cross of a T, and then it connects to New Brunswick. So. Um, there's a lot of rivers, too, uh, and a lot of bays. So his idea was he wanted to get 100 towns built all the way around there to protect them. Well, in 1625 is when he created them with King James. King James passed away, and his son, King Charles, took over. Uh, Charles liked the idea, too, so he started knighting all these uh, rich people. And they each had to provide six men that were skilled craftsmen to go over. So they started shipping them over. And uh, they didn't get the first boat over there till 1628. So it took a long time to get this thing going, but it was world changing. All right, really, so you know. and now where's Oak Island in all this, <coughs> as well, far as ge geography? Uh, the 
they settled on the leeward side, which would be, I guess you would say, the westward side of the island where they weren't getting such wind from, mm -hmm. from the ocean. But there's a big bay on the Atlantic side or eastern side called Mahone Bay, and it's a, a beautiful bay, and it's very deep into the land. Uh, the water isn't necessarily mm -hmm. that deep, but it's, it's deep into the land. Them. And Oak Island's right at the back of it. So okay. if you were in a storm, or if you were hiding from the enemy, or whatever the case would be, it is the most natural place. To, and there is a, uh, it's clear to sail in there, mm -hmm. where some places there's shoals and things like that. But there is a, even today, a yacht club has a, on their map, they have a trail that goes right by Oak Island, and they turn to the right a little bit to get into their yacht club. So. Uh, Geographically, it was perfect to, like I say, to hide from a storm or hide from an enemy or just to enjoy the scenery. So um, you could, before they built the causeway, which connects Oak Island now to the uh, right, we always to see the that land, on TV, yeah. you could actually sail all the way around Oak Island. So mm -hmm. you could park right behind there in about 30 foot of water and enjoy. You could go to the mainland to perhaps get some game Mm -hmm. or something like that, but you could stay on the island and not, and have like a built-in fort. Okay. Because, you know. So at this point, so in, in, in your uh, storyline that you've, that you've discovered and put together, Nova Scotia has been parceled out to a bunch of guys for a bunch of money. They get these titles. Thank you very much. Here's, here's your money. Here's your title. Now it's uh, Sir James, the Knight Baronet uh, right. of, of Northeast Pennsylvania. Yeah. Okay. And then... Um, the whole idea is, is then Nova Scotia is to be settled. And so your th research in theory, how does it connect now all these guys to Oak Island? Well, the, it, it, the Knights of Baronet were formed in 1625. The other thing that happened that year was this gentleman who had stolen this massive treasure also after three years of being indicted just out of the blue received a complete pardon his name was Al Strachan, huh. and he was uh, partnered with William Alexander. Some things Nova never change, do they, in this right, world? Right, <laughs> And, in fact, he uh, witnessed a, a deed for William Alexander when, when Alexander was given a, giving an area away to a Frenchman as a knight baronet to make peace, and that area included Oak Island. And so this guy is a known thief. Yes. And I understand something about a murder in there too. Well, the was he convicted of that? He he to one stole of your the wife, stole the wife and the money from this man, and this man died within a few months. So there's no record of what he died of. Uh, but he may have he may have died of the battle. You know, things were really rough back then. A lot different than they are. Today. Well, they're rough today. All right, too, so this guy's a known villain, and now he turns into like a like benefactor. Now he's a knight. Now he's a knight, and he's got money, and he's important. So uh, the first and only settlement. Well, there were two settlements. One was uh, where they had ousted the French, called Port Royal, and that's again on the leeward side or mm -hmm. the the uh, western side of Nova Scotia. But uh, Alexander himself had built a, a state right up above Oak Island, mm -hmm. about 17 miles up. But there's this old foundation up there. And um, so my first few books uh, were, again, finding out who these characters were, finding out the story behind the treasure and all of that. But it, after my uh, fourth book, <laughs> I realized that an awful lot of these names had connections to the Mayflower and to Plymouth Colony. Well, mm -hmm. that's when I realized that Bacon and Howard and Alexander all were part of that. They were in the background. So that's when I wrote this book, which is kind of a geneal genealogy book in the sense that it connects all, not all, many of the families from the Plymouth and So there's Oak Island and the Mayflower. To, so there's to Oak Island. Okay. And they would have known that there was something going on because they were, the reason Nova Scotia was created was to protect them. So then um, <laughs> I thought, well, then I'm going to start focusing specifically on this estate that Alexander's 
supposedly had up above uh, Oak Island that's 17 miles up into the hills. And so uh, this next book, Oak Island and New Ross, New Ross is the name of that community, but originally the name of that community was Charing Cross, and there's only one other Charing Cross in all of the world, in all of the history, and that's where Sir Francis Bacon, Thomas Howard, and William Alexander lived in London. And uh, so I found an abundance of uh, information, and I believe this is the first book that you provided me some <laughs> uh, good data on. Yeah, we and just, uh, We had fun with that. Yeah, and uh, because I had found this map, or this drawing, right. painting from 1634, and this is William Alexander Why getting the up charter. He, uh, Justin, can you get uh, up a little close? With, this is uh, William Alexander receiving uh, his uh, permit. <laughs> permit, yeah, basically to, to, from uh, King Charles. To, to found uh, Nova Scotia. And this is an actual painting, right? Yes, it was a painting, and all around this painting, it had little vignettes around the outside, mm -hmm. and Doc got the idea that maybe those were... Uh, hidden messages in there and we ended up deciphering <laughs> the whole all, picture yeah we had the there was the in art form there was the uh, uh coat of arms elements for the premier baronet at the time uh, gordon gordon and uh stratton because he's their uh shield was the highland stag we found the map and, of uh, uh, nova scotia there and uh, 17 ships 17 and ships. when i counted up Alexander never took 17 ships over there at once, but if you count up every one that we know of, it comes out to 17 ships. So I think it was meant to be like a composite of this is what he sent over there. So then, I, again, I thought I was done because I always thought I was done. I thought uh, I was done too. <laughs> this was up to seven books here, and uh, I happened to trip across the, th this 90-foot this, uh, stone always bugged me because it was found 90 foot down in the pit. Now, if it was supposed to be instructions to, on how to dig the pit, that would be pretty stupid. And that's what they've always said. It was instructions on how to dig the pit. But yeah. you wouldn't know. You, you wouldn't dig down get, here, you're going to find this and this and this. But yeah, it's already back, at the bottom of the pit. Yeah, now you have to go back in time and follow the instructions. So I didn't think it was that. So I was looking at the code that was on it, and I found that uh, there was a code, a historic code that Mary Queen of Scots created uh, because uh, she was, her story is very long. I really can't get into it here, but she was persecuted. Let's mm -hmm. just put it that way. And so in order for her to communicate with all of her supporters, she created this code. Which was very common, I understand, in those days. Yeah, yeah. In secret codes. So uh, I, I realized one day looking at it that uh, a number of the uh, code marks on the 90-foot stone happened to match code marks in her code. But I only had two sheets of her code at that time because they were available online. Mm -hmm. So I spent like three months uh, emailing every historical place I could think of and in England and Scotland. Well, I started in Scotland. Eventually, somebody in Scotland said, you're in the wrong country or the wrong area of the country because you got to go to the British uh, Museum. I went to the British Museum they said, they're over in the British Archives, National Archives. Went over there, they sent me, I had to pay for them, but they, they had never been scanned in. They were in a folder in the back room. Holy mackerel. And there were a uh, hundred and, I forget now, a hundred and some uh, code sheets, and they'd never been scanned in. So I, I literally paid them to scan them in for me so they'd also mm -hmm. have a digital copy. So I have the only digital copy in the world that I know of besides them. And every mark on the 90-foot stone was in her code, and you could make sense of the 90-foot stone now. But people will argue code. with you that a circle shows up with a dot in the middle. It could mean a million different things for different other treasures and things like that. Yeah, but when you get every single, every single uh, item, the only symbol on the 90-foot stone that was not in her code was a certain triangle that also happens to do with uh, Freemasonry. And at this time, when this, when my story takes place, this Thomas Howard, who I've mentioned a few times already now, was the Grand Master of the Stonemasons, not the Freemasons, of the Stonemasons. 
at the time. And his name was on the stone twice with that little special triangle right in front of it. So it was saying, Scottish Grandmaster of Stonemasons, Thomas Howard, blah, blah, blah. So um, in every book, there's sort of a main theme, and that's the main theme of this book, and it was, and the main theme of this book was uh, the uh, a secret estate, I guess they call it, up above mm -hmm. Oak Island. And the main theme of this was, yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, Mayflower, Plymouth, Boston people that took over Oak Island. So you keep painting and painting and painting the story, right? Yes. And, and deeper and deeper and deeper. And um, But in each book, there may be a main theme, mm -hmm. but there's also like spinoff themes of five or six uh, different directions, like a spoke. And what they're doing is they're providing just an unbelievable amount of information that says that these were the guys there. I mean, people who were the first searchers and the first, the first settlers on Oak Island, the first searchers on, the Oak, on Oak Island go back to these same people, either, the, either, in, May, either in Plymouth or Massachusetts or in Scotland. Um, or in the case of Thomas Howard and Francis Bacon. You, you, now, I know that people are, might be listening right now and you, and you use two terms, Freemasons and Stonemasons. So they're, they're different? Well, <coughs> the Stonemasons were, had been around for quite a while, but... I from, think they go back to like the Egyptian days, yeah, right? I right. mean, they're guys that cut stone. But in order, or the first record of any... Uh, and this is in a lot of Freemasonry literature, so mm -hmm. it's not something that I'm just coming up with, but a lot of the, uh, or the first two were sons of William Alexander. One of them was actually named William Alexander These Jr. These are now who? The, the These are the first three initiates into a stonemason's lodge that were not stonemasons. Okay. And I think they call them non-operative okay. accepted. Yeah. And the third one of all people in the world was Al Strachan. The villain, <laughs> yeah. thief. So, uh, and when, when I found that out, I'm like, well, that really adds to the story because along with the Vikings and the and uh, Captain Kidd and all that, the Freemasons were also uh, one of the legends about Oak Island. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's a legend because it wasn't a legend. Yeah, it's, it's true. You know, we, we've, we've got the evidence now. So I no sooner got this book out at the beginning of this year, and it's bas basically is talking about the... Uh, proof of the, that the stone existed and how I broke the code and what it all, how it all played into the story. So, so the, the, the Guinness should say, game over, we got this figured out. Well, yeah, but they want an X on the spot. <laughs> and that's why I wrote this book, because uh, Rick had okay. sent me an email one Christmas, can't remember the years now, but, and uh, he said, you know, this is fantastic background information. We still need to put an X on the spot. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not there. The island's already been turned into Swiss cheese. <laughs> but the one X on the spot that we know of is the 90-foot stone because it was dead center in the middle of the pit. So right. you can't get a better X. So that's, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to investigate it. I no sooner got this out this spring when a gentleman that's one of my readers that's bought all my books he bought it. He was one of the first three people to buy it. I can't tell who bought it, but I can tell how many <laughs> sold. And only three books had sold at that point. He sent me an email and said, wow, did you ever think that maybe Mary Queen of Scots got her code from some other source, like maybe the Templars? I had no idea she was associated with them. She, she signed off on the last two bits of land that were formerly Templar land in, in Scotland. Uh, one piece was given to the Alexander family. Another piece was uh, given to uh, the Sandy Lands family, and that gentleman was actually the legal representative of the Knights of St. John or the Knights of Malta and the Knights Templar. Mm -hmm. And she said, if you uh, turn in all Templar land, all the final Templar land, I will give you this big chunk of land and I will make you Lord Sandy Lands. And that's, so those were, and those were in the 1500s. So I look at her now as like, uh, the, not always personally involved, but she was like the breaking point between the era of the Templars like a bridge. and the era of the, of the uh, Freemasons. 
And uh, so <laughs> I, I said, You yeah, told me you were right. done last time. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I, when I started looking into it, that's when I started finding all this. So this is my latest book. Uh, Oak Island Knights Templar and Freemason. Okay, let's let's get a close up on that one because it's kind of a cool co uh, cover there. So, so wait a minute now. The you're talking about Knights Templar and Freemasonry. They're two different organizations, right? Right, but the f there were family connections. Mm -hmm. uh, there were uh, land connections, and I d I was. I knew there was something in the background, but I didn't know that I could get that specific. So what I do with this book is I begin with the end of the Templars and their battle at uh, Acre or Accra, depends on how you Over want to say in it, the in the Holy Land. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that the next to the last known Grand Master of uh, the Knights Templar actually was a, a forefather of Mary Queen of Scots. <laughs> and, uh, so I identified how it all fell apart at the end. And then uh, in my family is the McDonald family. Uh, we're the McQuiston branch of the McDonald family. And it, the last Lord of the Isles, which was a kingdom up above Scotland that was sometimes married into the Stuart family and sometimes mm -hmm. fought against them, they were dissolved in uh, 1503 uh, when the last Lord of the Isles died, and two years later, the King of Scotland gave um, his wife a piece of land in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And it became, she called it Mary's Chapel after the Blessed Virgin Mary. All right, let's hold that. I'm going to write that down, Mary's Chapel, and I have a caller. Okay. Good morning, caller. Well, good morning. This is Linda Spaulding. Hey, How Lynn. are you? How are you doing? I'm good. Good. Uh, I just wanted to say, um, I'm very interested in getting your guest book about Oak Island. Okay. Well, Which great. one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it would be the first one because I haven't read anything about it. Have you watched it on TV at all? Uh, I've seen it advertised, but I haven't watched it. I think there's something coming on this week about it. Right. I think this coming Tuesday, I think, is the yeah. season yeah. Well, that's the season opener for their their spinoff show which is beyond Oak Island where they look at other treasures but the actual show I think is going to start November 15th. Oh wow. So so the question is where do you get these books I guess? Is that the question? Yes. I knew there was a question, question. in there. <laughs> well uh, you can get them on Amazon.com. Uh, also um, there's a little bookstore. Genres. Genres. Knows this place. Right in Westfield that has a few of each book. And that would be the quickest because uh, you could just drive right down there and get it. But uh, they're all available on Amazon. And um, the reason I go through there is because I self-publish. And it's a, a self-publishing part of it is relatively simple. Now, I, one thing you'll notice is all the books are the exact same number of pages. <laughs> and I have nine of them. But I actually, I would... Um, I, I, it's really hard to pick out the one to read first. I, if you're new to it, I'd probably say Oak Island and New Ross because that really gives the background of how New Ross was connected to Oak Island. Uh, but any one of them will tell a, a lot about the island. Uh, I, a lot of times I tell people start from the front and go backwards. Start with my latest, go, you know, go backwards that way. Uh, but the original book was called uh, Oak Island. Oh boy, I don't remember. Sixteen thirty-two. Is <laughs> that the first one? Yeah. Um, no, that was no, the no, that was one. the medallion one. Yeah, yeah. O Oak Island. Uh, see, there's so many books. I tell you. <laughs> but anyway, uh, actually, I'll tell you what it was because it's right in here. See, uh, books by uh, other books by this author, <laughs> and I am that author. Oh, Oak, I Oak Island. Missing Links. There it is. That was the first one. And what that was was more general of taking each one of these legends, let's say, and paring them down to what historically or logically could be proven, whether they were true or not. What I found is that a lot of legends have something 
uh, real behind them, but what happens is the story gets, it's the old parlor game. Mm -hmm. uh, did you hear this? And then did you hear this? Yeah. By the time it gets around, you know, and a lot of times people want to glorify it or make a better story of it. So <laughs> it could be a very mundane thing. I had to go here and then you turn out to be some kind of a hero that right. charged in at the last minute or whatever. So then there you go. As you go down and see. Well, I'm uh, looking Shane. forward to it. Um, and good luck with everything. Thank you. And uh, I also wanted to say, Doc, uh, the growlers were great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't call in because I you didn't couldn't. Want to interrupt the music. But you couldn't. It was tape. It was pre-taped, so we oh, weren't it even was here. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was great. It okay, was thank really you. Thank great. I appreciate that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, stay tuned, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Okay. Have a great weekend. Thanks, okay, Jim. Bye we're bye. down to about four minutes, so let's let's uh, keep playing. Okay. Along. Well, so we'll stick with this one. So yeah. I found where the chapel was. Uh, it Mary's. was a Catholic chapel right in the middle of Edinburgh. Then after the Reformation, it uh, it was empty, and it and it was owned by a guy who actually traced back to the Templars, and in uh, 1618. King Charles sent Sir Francis Bacon, mm -hmm. Thomas Howard, mm -hmm. up to Scotland for something that had to do with real estate. He sent him in November of 1618, and Mary's Chapel was purchased for the Masons in 1618. So once again, another connection. Right. And then all the other guilds started meeting there because it was a fairly big hall. Right. But that is where the Alexander Boys and Al Strachan were uh, initiated as the first Freemasons from what anything we can tell. So they still carry the name, it's called Edinburgh Lodge Number no. 1, Mary's Chapel. And okay. they moved out of that area, they have another building, mm -hmm. but they still say Mary's Chapel in that other building. So that's the history behind that. So uh, I've connected, in this last book, I've connected a lot of these people that were, were involved with chartering the chapel originally and then being Freemasons in it to the Knights Templar. There's not, there's, this is all pragmatic connections. It's not uh, esoteric, right. like, oh yeah, they studied this right, Egyptian, right, right. and they studied this. Right. It's actual people. There's, studying the families and the genealogies, not seriously into the genealogy, but who was connected to who, reveals an incredible amount of information. So that's, a lot of my books are built on who was connected to who. Okay, and, land, and for those of live. us that watch the show faithfully every year, lots of wood, bits and pieces, a lot of it does go back to the era that you're talking, yep. the 1620s, 1630s. Yep. So I'm sure you get this question all the time. So is there treasure on Old Island? Well, I believe there was. Uh, I believe there might be some remnants of it left. I think there's a chance that the original diggers got some of it, mm -hmm. and then when the first industrial group came in, they might have got some of it too. For instance, a, a descendant of Al Strachan was one of the early landowners on Oak mm -hmm. Island. He may have been one of the people that walked away with it. So, but I think because the digging was so erratic back then and they didn't have big toys like the Laginas have, mm -hmm. things got shuffled around a lot and so I I would not give up looking in the pit mm -hmm. because that's where it was originally and when I was up there in 2021 Rick was telling me about this muon technology where they they are detecting little elements that came in from space mm -hmm. and they it takes seven months but it'll show you chambers right. under the ground and cool. I know they did it and okay. that's what this year's going to be about okay so are you going back to Oak Island I don't know. Will you be on TV again? I don't know. So we got lots of mysteries there. So Jim, you have connected Knights Templars and the Freemasons yes, in Oak Island. Yes, absolutely. And the book is, one more time? Oak Island, Knights Templar, and Freemasons. And you can get this down in genres, down in uh, Westfield? Yes, or on or, Amazon. Or on Amazon. All right, Jim, thanks for coming in. Uh, this is fascinating as always. And what's our next project, by the way? You really want to know? <laughs> yes! <laughs> I'm going to take on Skinwalker Ranch. All right, let's do it. You heard it first here, folks. All right, it's a wrap. We, we can do this all day, but Jim McQuiston, uh, author, uh, researcher uh, for Oak Island and a myriad of other topics, been my guest. So you can watch this over and over again and check other shows that Jim's been on here 
and we'll see you next time uh, here on Chautauqua Sunrise. I'm Doc Hamels. See you later. Bye-bye.